good morning still. Uh, I hope you all had a great time. Someone said to me, that was a transformative experience listening to Zeke Emanuel. And I said, it always is. Uh, it's always incredibly important to place some of our work in the context of the big challenges. Um, I'm punting for Lori Melikar, and it is my honor and thrill to, um, I introduced Shelley White Means yesterday at the beginning of the conference. She has been an extraordinary member, consistent and engaged member of the National Advisory Committee for the Inquiry Program. She has an extraordinarily different title at East Tennessee. University of Tennessee Health Science Center. I remember this word around economic empowerment and uh, the great leadership that's needed to uh, develop the kind of programs that she's done. But I've gotten to know Shelley first um, when she told a story about being a student of Mark Pauley's. And I thought, ah, there are these six degrees of separation that I think uh, have helped to connect us. I'm sure that Mark reached out uh, when we were designing this program to say who out there could help us guide it, um, be a major part and contributor to the grantee teams as they unfold um, and contribute um, uh, unbelievably to the design and implementation of this program. So we are really honored and thrilled that Shelley is here today to kind of join with us in the sense of what we've done um, and to serve as the moderator for this panel. Thank you, Shelley. And Lori will be coming in with babies. <laughs> as an economist, I would say yay to productivity of all sorts. <laughs> Um, I'd like to welcome you to this panel uh, whose emphasis is on measuring nurses' contributions to the quality of healthcare, progress, challenges, and future directions. And for me, this panel is dealing with this question. Can you tell what something is if you cannot measure it? No. <laughs> 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 and so we're going to emphasize measurement on today. Our strategy is this. We will start with a brief introdu introduction of each of our panelists. Uh, then uh, Susie Beck will give us a summary of the excellent work that has been performed by four of the inquiry teams, interdisciplinary inquiry teams. And uh, then there'll be, they will, we will have direct questions to each of the panelists. And I know you will be waiting with anticipation to get your questions asked of the panelists, and we'll provide that opportunity next uh, after the panelists address their individual questions. So that's our strategy. Here's our introduction of the panelists. Our first panelist is Susan Beck. She is professor at the University of Utah College of Nursing. Her research addresses the management of symptoms in cancer patients and interventions to improve the quality and outcomes of care and includes methodological studies to test the psychometric properties of tools to measure patient reported outcomes including fatigue, sleep, and neuropathic pain. Recently her work has focused on translating tools to improve the quality of care related to pain management uh, into practice. Dr. Beck is leader in the Oncology Nursing Society Quality Measures Initiative and the American Academy of Nursing Expert Panel on Quality. Dr. Beck has had two research projects funded through the inquiry program. That's the importance of the emphasis. The first was to develop and test a questionnaire that can be used to measure opinions of patients about how their nurses manage their pain. The second builds on this work by disseminating and implementing evidence-based approaches to measuring and improving pain care and outcomes. Our second panelist, Marianne Wise, is an associate professor and Wheaton Franciscan sister, Rosalie Klein, professor of women's health at Marquette University College of Nursing. Dr. Wise's research focuses on transition from hospital care to home self-management across patient populations. Her inquiry team conducted a quality and cost analysis of nurse staffing, 
discharge preparation and post-discharge readmission and emergency department use. They found that when units had more RN hours per patient day, fewer overtime hours and fewer vacancies, the discharge teaching was of higher quality, patients reported greater readiness for hospital discharge, and post-discharge utilization and readmission and emergency room visits were lower as well as costs were lower. Nancy Ryan Winger is the Director of Nursing Research at National Children's Hospital and Professor Emeritus at The Ohio State University College of Nursing. She is a member of Nationwide's Center for Innovation in Pediatric Practice. The goal of the center is to improve the health of children and their families through research on novel methods for delivering health services in the community. Dr. Ryan Winger's <coughs> inquiry project identified hospitalized children's perception of the linkages between the quality of nursing care and outcomes. The study identified the nursing care processes and outcomes that matter most <coughs> to children during their hospitalization and estimated the extent to which disparities exist in the quality of their care and outcomes. <coughs> The results of this study have value in themselves, but also provide valid content for new age appropriate patient satisfaction skills for hospitalized children. Our fourth panelist, Nancy Donaldson, is a clinical professor and director of the UCSF Center for Evidence-Based Patient Care Quality Improvement, a Joanna Briggs Institution Affiliate, Affiliate Center. Dr. Donaldson was formerly the founding director for the Center for Nursing Research and Innovation at the UCSF School of Nursing. Since 1996, she has served as the co-principal investigator for the Collaborative Alliance for Nursing Outcomes Project, or CalNAP, a robust international nursing quality measurement research and development project. Her inquiry team developed a predictive model examining individual and collective efforts, uh, excuse me, effects of unit level nurse workload, staff nurse characteristics, and selected risk assessment and preventive intervention processes of care on variance in nursing sensitive outcomes of acute care medical surgical units. We have an impressive panel and their work is similarly impressive. We will begin with a summary of this work by Susan Beck. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Great, thanks. Um, well, it's very exciting to be here for this anniversary celebration, um, but it's also somewhat hard to believe that we're at the end of this inquiry journey, which I know has been an important part of the lives of many of us. And I'd just like to begin by thanking the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the inquiry leadership, including Mary and Paul, but also the whole advisory committee, I think for their vision and their support for this project and the way they've really tried uh, to stretch us to, to be pioneers and enter into some new territory. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, um, as, as I begin, uh, my colleagues on the panel and uh, contributors to our paper, and of course, the assumption for this meeting is that everyone had the opportunity to uh, read our papers in advance, and I'm sure some of you didn't, some of you didn't. And so um, uh, I would just say that our intent is to use the dialogue and the input that we have to make the paper better. So if you didn't have a chance to read it, and now you get excited to read it on the way home, um, <laughs> we still would welcome any suggestions you have uh, to help us uh, make it a better uh, paper. Uh, our paper, in fact, are exemplars, and I really sort of want to have a disclaimer that um, in no way do we want to uh, sort of set the expectation that we're covering the whole watershed of inquiry work and across 40 projects. I think there have been a lot of other contributions to this, but what we've tried to do is say from our four examples, which in fact are very different um, from each other, what can we learn across them that maybe helps inform where we are um, in terms of the science. 
Uh, and so we will be, really value the input um, of the audience and the dialogue that we hope to have after this brief presentation. Um, and so our goal really is to look at sort of the progress in terms of where we started uh, in 2005, 2006, um, and then maybe talk about what do we need to do next or how it, do we need to do things differently, which is a little bit uh, where, where I've come to uh, think. Uh, so if you think about where we were um, around 2005, I guess the first thing as I look back is so much has changed that it probably would take a whole talk just to talk about all the things that have changed in our lives um, in this brief uh, period of time. Uh, but, but it's important, I think, to reflect on where we were so we can use this as uh, a milestone to say how have we advanced. And at that time, and I think Mary did a nice job in the, in the opening talking about the development of the uh, NQF 15 nurse sensitive measures, which I think was a very much a milestone um, for our profession. And it really came out of saying that we need a robust set of standardized measures. But I think as the work took place trying to identify those measures, there was also some discontent <laughs> with the amount of evidence we had and what kind of measures we had the evidence to put forward to be part of that data set, um, which is what really stimulated a lot of the inquiry work. Um, that led to a series of um, white papers that actually were sort of pre-inquiry and I think very much informed the calls for proposals and the whole strategic um, plan for inquiry. And one of the key messages, and which is why the first cohort really focused on measurement, is that in a way the lack of measures was a bottleneck to our progress. And so um, the very early, especially uh, cohort one inquiry was very much focused on how we could develop better measures related to measuring <coughs> nursing's contribution to quality. Um, and then I think from there began to try to build to obviously more uh, complex like the relationships between uh, the process structure and outcomes that we were measuring. So as I sort of review the white papers um, and our team looked at where the state of the science was, these were sort of seven major gaps that were identified around that time. And so I thought I'd like to, we would use this as a framework for our discussion, discussion to talk about where were we and then how did our projects contribute um, and maybe then that will set the stage for where we need to go. Um, first of all, <coughs> the, one of the main gaps was that some of the measures were very specific <coughs> to specific populations and if you think about the NQF 15, I think there were smoking cessation in heart attack patients. <laughs> well, why only heart attack patients and doesn't any, you know, and so, and so we ne really needed to start thinking about are there measures that are sort of core to nursing's contribution that cross uh, the types of patient populations and settings that we have. Um, and I think our teams exemplify really grabbing some of those Im important things. We looked at pain, discharge planning, pressure ulcers, catheter associated infections, and perceptions of daily care by children who were hospitalized. Uh, and so all of those I think are nice examples of um, areas to measure that in fact are cross-cutting. Uh, the second major area was the need for measures of the patient family experience. And when I think now to where we are with um, the whole uh, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute and the whole role that engaging patients and families plays in the National Priorities Partnership, um, priorities for example, I think that actually there was a lot of foresight to identify this as an important uh, area. And again, I think our teams uh, definitely address this in the approach, the patient-centered approach that we took to developing measures. And I think we can conclude that we have added to the evidence that acutely ill hospitalized patients and children can make judgments about their care that can inform our practice and help us to improve. I think one important piece of our process was that we engaged the patients and the children in particular in developing the tools. So we did, you know, we started with what's important to you, what helps to define quality and built on that. But then we also realized that we had to have measures that in fact were brief and actionable. 
which I think are really important criteria. The third main um, area is the measures of symptom variables and the relationship to process and outcomes. And two of our teams focused here. Um, Dr. Weiss's team worked on measures related to discharge planning and how, uh, I think as you talked about the data, how RN staffing measures related uh, to those processes and outcomes. And then Dr. Donaldson's team at UCSF worked on trying to develop a composite approach to, to measuring uh, some of the, what we call structure or system variables, in particular related to uh, the nurse factors like education and certification and experience and, and those um, types of uh, structural variables. Uh, the fourth major area is the cross, uh, measures which cross the continuum of care. And I, again, the work about related to discharge planning, I think, really exemplifies uh, trying to focus on this area where not only looking at uh, the patient readiness for discharge planning, but then what are the outcomes after words after the transition to um, home or an alternate setting. Um, fourth, or the next one is to focus on positive processes and outcomes. And I just heard that song, Accentuate the Positive. I thought, well, <laughs> that sort of goes with, uh, <laughs> with this goal. And uh, again, we have some nice examples because we developed measures that included things like believing patients' reports of pain providing daily comfort care to children, and preparing patients for discharge, which are all, all very positive aspects of nursing, not focused on uh, negative, adverse events. Um, but not to say those are important, but I think this was a gap that, that we have worked to try to address. Uh, linking processes to outcomes. So at, in all of our studies, we measured not only process and sometimes structure, but also outcomes and, and have uh, added to the evidence showing the relationships between the processes of care and outcomes from a patient perspective. And then finally, the interdisciplinary context, which has been a main uh, theme of this, uh, this conference so far. Um, I would say our primary example here relates to pain management, where we, when we develop the measures, look not only at the nursing care related to pain management, but the interdisciplinary team care related to pain management. Um, some of which wasn't in our original proposal, but came from um, advice. Mary talked about how we all changed our ideas <laughs> along the way from um, stakeholders and the National Advisory Panel. But I think we have a way to go here uh, uh, to begin to say, how are we going to model the care provided by different people and factor it into how we understand the processes of care? Okay, so to move to sort of the key discussion points, <coughs> Um, each team uh, in our paper provided a brief report, and I've sort of pulled out some examples across, across the reports um, of the process they used, what products they've created, and the next steps uh, that their team plans. Uh, and then we tried to summarize what were some of the key challenges that we identified trying to do this work. And we focused on three. Uh, one is measuring the care delivery from multiple perspectives. So, of course, we went in going for that patient perspective. That was a gap. But then we realized that that gives us different information than if you look at it, say, discharge planning from the nurse perspective um, in terms of what care was actually delivered by the nurse. And both of those might be important. Then you add into that the interdisciplinary perspective. Um, so how do we get all of these multiple perspectives and get at the measures that really, that really matter? Uh, Second, somewhat related to that, is how do we get the, at the dose of the intervention? And I think this, again, gets to be um, quite complicated when you look at all of the types of care that any one individual might receive. How do you actually find out which parts <laughs> um, they got and how does that convert into anything that's meaningful and was it appropriate or not? So, so the whole complexity around understanding the dose of care delivered, I think, is a is a key challenge. And then finally is this whole area of measuring the entire care experience. And as we sort of thought about the different parts of that, of course we have the structure, and then you have the process, and then we have that, is it the nurse perspective or the patient perspective? But there's that whole big thing we don't understand, like what do the patients actually do once we give them an intervention? And 
not only how do they experience it, but do they follow it? I mean, someone mentioned yesterday when they interviewed the patients, they found out they never read the discharge instructions that they got when they went home. So, you know, do they do what we tell them to do? And I think that's an important piece of quality because, to be honest, all the other things don't matter if you don't change what it is that the patient, if their adherence or their behavior, which is a, is a critical missing piece as we look to the future. Um, so in terms of future directions, and this is where I'm hoping we could have a lot of discussion, we really have started to wonder how does the whole transformation that's happening with the electronic health record, which we just heard about, and it's happening big time, lots of money, lots of change, how does that really affect our measures? And the reality is we really need to be thinking about e-measures. In fact, as we meet, the National Quality Forum is having a big conference on e-measures um, in a neighborhood nearby. And so if we have that as our end point, do we need to look at this whole process differently? So we've all approached it from the very traditional developing psychometric tools perspective. And then, you know, try to make it relevant and actionable and brief. But what really can be an electronic record and how can we like have that end in mind and both build upon our work and integrate it into the electronic records that are developing, which is one piece, but also as we think about new tools, do we need to have a different starting point, a different lens? And I think um, there are some opportunities for partnerships related to developing these types of e-measures that we need to be taking advantage of. Just uh, last week, I was at the Society of Behavioral Medicine meeting um, and heard a report on a group from SBM that is working with the National Institutes of Health to develop cross-cutting measures related to preventive health behaviors. Well, obviously that's very important, I think, to understanding nursing's contribution. And so how do we um, become a part of that, leverage a partnership, but also learn from how they're approaching it because they are establishing some new criteria with an e-measures um, vision that I think could inform our future work. Uh, as we've talked about the interdisciplinary colleagues we need to involve, uh, clearly our informatics colleagues, some of whom are here, I think need to be key partners um, in this work because they're actually very much involved right now um, in developing all of the criteria related to interoperability and meaningful use. And so I think I'd, we'd like to stimulate some discussion. How do we get from the model that we've had to where the future is going? And again, just like this time, we have to get there quickly. <laughs> so I'll stop there and turn it back to Shelley. Okay, I'd like to ask the first question of Susie Beck. Susie, you were a member of Inquiry's first cohort, which focused on measurement and the National Quality Forum's 15 nursing sensitive measures. You were also awarded another Inquiry grant four years later to build on your initial work. How has the discussion of measurement evolved since the release of the NQF 15? Okay. Um, does everyone hear me? want to be sure capturing this for the recording as well. Well, I think one key thing, and it actually relates a little bit to some of what our previous speaker talked about, is I think measurement and quality are really getting tied to money. <laughs> um, and that's a big change that's happened. So I think when we first started this project, um, we, were, we were concerned about it really very much from a quality lens. Uh, but, and the measures that were coming, say, from CMS, and there was lots of talk about pay for performance, but people actually called it pay for measurement. <laughs> you know, so I think we've shifted from pay for, for measurement to now where there actually are some real financial consequences if you don't meet certain quality indicators. I don't think that's totally translated to nursing yet, but I certainly can see that coming. And I think if you look at some indicators, like <coughs> the HCAPs, post-hospital survey, for example, um, peop, it, this is really getting people's attention. Um, and so I, I think that that's um, an important shift. And at the same time, because of that, 
the work of doing quality is really increasing for hospitals. And so as we, for example, did our qualitative interviews um, with nurses in our, in our translation project, I mean, over and over it was about, well, we've got all these quality things going and we've got to measure this and we've got to do the falls data and we've got, and so how within that sort of increasing intensity of quality do we get at what's important and make it manageable? And that's where I think, again, getting into the EHR where we can actually generate real-time reports on people's quality is where we need to go. This is a question for Marianne Wise. What are the challenges of measuring nurses' performance in a study like yours with outcomes that relate to what happens to patients after they leave the nurse's care? Thanks, Shelley. Um, well, I think um, Susie, in fact, answered the question probably, but I'll go into it in a little bit more detail. The three challenges that are listed up there are, in fact, the three challenges. Um, that we faced within our study. Um, our study used a structure process outcome um, framework. Um, I won't talk too much about the structure piece because I know Nancy in a little while is gonna talk a lot about um, nurse staffing issues. Um, so, uh, but we certainly uh, were measuring nurse staffing. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the process um, and outcome measures um, that we used on those three challenges that we had. In terms of a process measure, we used um, a measure of quality of discharge teaching um, as our measure of process. When you think about discharge teaching, it's a process that happens over the course of hospitalization. It's provided by more than one nurse, hopefully, and not just the 15 minute special before people leave the hospital. Um, it's delivered by nurses, but received by patients and there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between what the nurse does and what the patient receives. So we made some choices about um, measuring it from a patient-centric perspective. We did measure the patient's perspective, the receiver characteristics, if you like, of, um, of the nursing process and what patients got. Um, we did not measure um, what nurses did specifically from either an observation or from direct um, data collection with nurses. Um, so I think there are, some, there are some interesting opportunities to pursue um, in terms of looking at those, the, the disparate relationships between those. Um, in terms uh, of our outcome measures, we, measure, we had a measure at the time of hospital discharge looking at readiness for discharge. Again, the perspective issue um, was a real question for us. We measured patients' perspectives um, on readiness for hospital discharge, different perhaps than nurses' perspectives, different perhaps than, um, uh, than physicians' perspectives. And so we had a measure of patients' ideas about were they ready to go home. Um, and our, interestingly, our continuing work now is around teasing out those differences between perspectives and what it means in terms of the ability to predict outcomes remote from hospitalization. So our interest had always been in looking at what nurses do in hospitals and how that affects an outcome after the patient leaves um, the acute care nurse's care anyway. So we did find some relationships between um, patients' perceptions of discharge readiness, but um, with some guidance and counseling from um, the inquiry um, leadership team over time. We also um, inserted into our study about halfway through um, a measure of nurses' perceptions. And so the question we're asking now is who knows best um, in terms of readiness for discharge, at least as it um, is a predictor of emergency department and, um, and readmission. And we, we always ask the question in our presentations, who do you think knows best, the nurse or the patient? What do you all think? Patient. In our, in our data and in the replicate study that we've just completed, it was the nurse who was a better predictor, uh, which is kind of interesting. And so we're sort of trying to tease out what it is that the nurse is picking up um, at the time, immediately before discharge, that is a predictor of outcome. Um, part of your question, Shelley, was about um, you know the difficulties with measuring outcomes remote from discharge. Certainly part of the difficulty is making the connection between the two. Um, we certainly had the, uh, the issues that others have reported um, yesterday about trying to do cross-hospital searching um, for 
emergency departments and readmission. We were working with a large healthcare system, multi-hospital um, healthcare system, who assured us at the beginning that they could do cross-hospital searching. <coughs> Well, they can now, but with a lot of coaching from one of our <laughs> one of our investigators, we finally found um, some mechanisms for doing that. But it was certainly not as easy as. Um, and we did find that we would have lost about 20% of our emergency department visits and readmissions had we not done within system hospital searching. Um, we did some follow-up phone calls and and to find out. Um, uh, what kind of loss we were getting outside of the hospital system. And in this particular system, because of some insurance plan issues in Wisconsin, we estimated we were only losing about 1.5 to 2%, um, which is not bad considering so. okay. some of the challenges. Thanks. Um, question for Nancy Ryan Winger. Why is it important to measure children's perception in addition to their parents? Um, that's the whole crux of my <laughs> research and um, <clears throat> the, the impetus for doing this was that um, when I moved from academia to the service setting it was a culture shock of course but then in our executive meetings we would sit there and analyze the patient satisfaction data which of course is, is pivotal to every hospital and um, I asked to see a copy of the questionnaire that goes out the survey. And when I looked at it, I was struck by the fact that in the, on the questionnaire, in the upper right corner, it was who completed this form. And then they had parent or guardian. Um, and then they had other. And then I'm thinking, now, wait a minute. So if, if a child who, you know, say he's 10 years old, uh, could have filled out this form, but he would have been other as opposed to the patient. So I got incensed about that because um, all of my previous research had to do with um, studying stress and coping and stress <coughs> symptoms from the children's perspective. And there's a lot of research out there that says that um, parents are not good reporters of how their children are thinking or feeling or perceiving and experiencing. And so I, I thought, well, perhaps I should look into this further. And so I looked around to see if there were <coughs> any uh, pediatric patient satisfaction forms that were really done, written for children. And at that time, there weren't any. And as far as I know, no hospitals do that. Why is it important to ask the children? Because they're the ones who are receiving the care and their perceptions of the care matter. Sometimes hospitalization is a formative experience for children. And uh, well, many times it, it ends up being kind of a positive experience in that they may want to pursue being a nurse or a physician or someone in the medical <coughs> profession um, in the future. But um, more importantly, we think that the children's experiences can be improved, but we don't know what's important to them. In our study, we asked the children uh, a lot of questions, but basically open-ended questions. What what do you like best about your nursing care and what do you like least? <laughs> and we also asked their parents, um, what do you think your child would say they like best and least? And there is no match. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, there's no match. So that's why it's important. <laughs> and uh, we interviewed 496 children, so we, we had a, a wonderful data set to, uh, to collapse. We collapsed the, their statements, which are wonderful, um, into 12 categories of positive nurse behaviors and six categories of negative. Um, the positive nurse behaviors were, number one was, gives me what I need when I need it. We, that's probably predictable. 
Number two was kind of a shock to us, and that is checks on me often. And we also asked them to tell us what they liked and didn't like, and then how did that make you feel? And um, giving me what I need when I need it, what, that made them feel special, that made them feel important. Um, one little kid said, it, it makes me feel like a real person, not just another patient. Um, and then as far as checks on me, the idea of safety came up all the time. It makes me feel safe because otherwise I'm scared. Um, so the categories are somewhat logical, but if we didn't ask them, we wouldn't know. We also discovered some developmental trends that made sense, like plays with me was really important too. The little ones, but not, and uh, talks and listens to me was most important to the adolescents. But across the age groups from six to 21 years, all of them mentioned all of these at some point or another. So at first we thought we might establish age-based um, forms, but it's not really necessary. It's just how much of each of those they really want. So I think I answered the question. Yeah, I hope so. Um, a question for Nancy Donaldson. What challenges did you confront in pursuing the development of a composite measure and what would you recommend to other investigators pursuing this research aim in the future? Thank you. Well, I think um, our goal in developing the composite measure was to go beyond what we considered the headcount strategy for understanding characteristics of staffing. Headcount is hours of care and skill mix, the common sort of metrics. And we'd been collecting data on education, certification, and years of experience in this patient care setting for some time using an RN education experience survey. It uh, had not been universally adopted um, by those Kelnock hospitals participating in our work. But uh, we had observed that if you looked at the relative influence of education or experience or certification, we had seen a little theme, for instance, that certification was associated with the nurse sensitive outcome measures that uh, we were using from the NQF portfolio, specifically falls, pressure ulcers, restraint. Um, but we also had data that's unique to Kelnock on um, nurse uh, medication administration accuracy, looking at both safe practices and errors in meds. And we were curious because we really felt to advance the safety of patients at the microsystem level, we needed to try to understand how education, certification, and experience might interact so that besides hours of care and skill mix, we could begin to describe an interactional composite variable that might help nurse leaders in clinical and administrative roles to better staff their units to reflect some of these characteristics that we believe from prior research are important, but in interaction, difficult to quantify and certainly diff difficult to measure. Um, so the bad news is that we found that the sample that we had was insufficient to really produce the kind of composite measure with reliability and integrity that we were looking for. In fact, we found that there were issues related to response rate, which is huge. Anytime you're surveying at the microsystem level, you've got to have a minimum response rate, and we set the standard at 25%. In addition, there was a phenomena of missing data, and if the data compromised the integrity of the survey. So we lost data due to response rate issues either missing, unreported, or insufficient to our threshold. So that's the bad news, that the uh, exciting work we were doing allowed us, of course, and that will be in subsequent publications, to really <coughs> understand, and the inquiry work will forever be, um, I, I want to say appreciated, we'll forever be grateful for the support that allowed us to explore other aspects of structure process and outcome that we think are invaluable to <coughs> understanding care at the microsystem level. 
But of course, the challenge is, are there other data sources? And when you look at nurse staffing information such as this, they're usually the purview of the hospital, and often they're not in the same place. So HR may have one thing, and, and the nursing office may have another. So coming up with a standard measure, and our nurse staffing survey, I think, uh, <coughs> is invaluable. And I know the National Database for Nursing Quality has integrated their nurse staffing variables into their larger RN uh, job or role satisfaction work. And definitely, uh, as we look at uh, our own measure of RN job satisfaction, we believe the integration of the RN survey so that it's in one spot for one fell swoop would be important. We also think moving forward, based on what we know now, and I think it's really important, Susie, when she was talking about future directions, said we have to be ready to go fast. And that would be our impression. Because we are a nurse-sensitive benchmarking registry in the era also of merging PSOs, et cetera, um, we think this whole area is exploding in its pace and <coughs> complexity. So our future work will also integrate measures of culture and um, the practice environment, et cetera, trying to continue to grow the picture of what factors may, in fact, uh, impact the collective characteristics of the workforce as they produce both process and outcomes of care. And the other thing I think we need to consider is that, uh, as we talk about the electronic health record, is that there's really two concurrent sort of uh, initiatives uh, moving in this area. The first is to capture, certainly, across the continuum of care, the, uh, the patient process of care, the episode, those diagnostic and, and uh, treatment uh, interactions with the patient so that they're retrievable and so that the diagnostic, prognostic, and care uh, is in f aspects of care can be used moving forward. But the other thing that we're acutely aware of is in 2005, with the um, Affordable Care Act, uh, this nation uh, took, uh, uh, really took on the commitment to develop a standardized format called common formats for capturing adverse events, near misses, and other uh, patient safety breaches, and hospitals and nursing homes to start, but it's also crossing the continuum. And so I encourage you, if you're not aware of the Common Formats Initiative, to do visit PSO, Patient Safety Organization, ppc.gov, pso.ppc.gov, because what we see happening is that the NQF 15, those nurse-sensitive measures, among many others that have been marked as characteristics of patient care quality, have been integrated into Common Formats, which are being used by PSOs, and I believe the current number is 60 to 70 of them around the country to collect data and to submit it to a national database for public reporting, research, et cetera. So the reason this is all relevant is that I think it's so critical as clinical uh, and academic scholars that our ongoing measurement build on not just what we've learned in this work, which is influential, because I believe this work can also inform the nation's common formats work. And um, the PSO invitational meeting followed by the vendors who are using the common formats was held two weeks ago in Bethesda. And so I think we need to constantly ask ourselves, are our measures state of the art in terms of where the nation's going? Because when we were raised, in our academic programs, we were taught to use measures that were valid and reliable in science. But we also need to look at how public policy is adopting and moving our measures into public policy arenas, and in that process, maybe modifying them somewhat. But that measure may be the one we <coughs> want to use moving forward. Does that make sense? I, I'm hoping so, because I think that's the main learning for us is that certainly developing a, common, a composite measure was more difficult than we knew. And, it, and we did find, as I actually reported, that if we 
tortured the data a little and brought in some other years and let the outliers stand that we could start to get a hint of a composite measure. But that wasn't ideal because then we were bringing in characteristics of the workforce that weren't caring for the body of patients that we were using in our outcome measures. So if we stuck to the rules of engagement, which were which staff took care of these patients, could we load a composite to help explore the impact of that on these outcomes? Are you with me? We couldn't quite pull it off. That doesn't mean we're not going to keep playing ball with that work because we think it's important. But we are going to add a culture of safety and some other characteristics to help explain or expand what we might consider workforce characteristics. And finally, um, uh, that uh, our work moving forward has to be aligned with federal efforts. Uh, and if you're using measures that are also measures of adverse events or patient safety issues, you need to look at what the big picture is and participate in that. I've had the opportunity to be appointed to the NQF ARC Patient Safety Organization Common Formats Expert Panel, and uh, <laughs> which is why it may sound like I'm um, encouraging you to learn more about that, and I am, because I really think it's critical in our ongoing scientific, strategic, and uh, public policy efforts that we align our measures. Thank you. Are there questions and comments from the audience? Yes. I think in the paper, if I'm remembering correctly, it was about kind of the time spent with the uh, patient. And Marianne, I'm thinking about your guys' work with the discharge teaching as well and how um, it really is a methods issue about how do we capture the dose of nursing intervention that we're doing, not just time, but what is it that we're actually doing, mm -hmm. um, the actions. And I don't think John Welton's here, and I don't know if his, I think his partner in crime was earlier, but I think they were kind of getting at the same thing with their inquiry study. And so I'm really intrigued and would like the panel's ideas about the dose of the nursing intervention and also wondered if um, uh, there's a paper by David Reed who's done some dosing of intervention work um, using standardized language, which we, we could then pull out of the e EHR, uh, et cetera. So I'd just like your ideas on that. I'll, I'll start, though. I know others will we'll have many comments about it as well. And I'll just, just address two particular points. One of them, um, from, at least from the perspective of our study, was the issue about care given versus care received. We only measured care received, but I think the whole conversation about dosing um, is is a interesting and incredibly complicated one because typically we only measure from one perspective, um, and we may want to think about taking a multi-perspective approach um, as we continue to do work with process. Um, and the other comment I'll just make it in relation to what you said Leigh, was the um, the whole issue of measuring nursing action, and I guess we need to measure action, but also the cognitive process that goes on and how do we do that? It's hard to observe thinking. Um, and yet so much of what we do is, uh, is thinking based. There may be an obvious action attached, maybe not, I don't know. Question more than answer. I guess the only thing I would add to that is we've of course been measuring hours of care and skill mix uh, and other sort of quantitative indicators of staffing. And we've been convinced easily for a decade that it's not about the head count. You could have the best hours of care and the best skill mix. It's about what the nurses do, meaning the action. <laughs> so with our inquiry work, we started really for the first time being able to describe better the structure of process outcome. So that you could have incredible hours of care and 100% RN. But if, as a key process indicator, there was a risk assessment for falls or for pressure ulcers, if the patients at risk were not, in fact, uh, uh, provided with an intervention that was, in fact, evidence-based and appropriate to their risk factors, you were going to have lousy outcomes. And so it's opening that black box. 
And Dr. Lena Gunningberg has published the first article from our international collaboration talking about Kelnock data and Swedish data and how the staffing was different. And she actually presented a paper at the National European Press Advisory Council in Birmingham, England two years ago where she pointed out the Kelnock measure of risk assessment is in the 90s and those at risk on intervention is in the 90s. And they didn't believe it. They said, oh, that can't be. <laughs> but of course, our data is um, the median for Kelnock pressure ulcers is zero. Uh, that's across over 200, approaching 300 hospitals. Everybody's going, woo! And I, I believe it's because they've been working on the structure as well as the process, as well as the outcome. That's what the data suggests. So um, I think when you look at dose, you've really got to look at what else is going on in the black box. Well, and I'll just add one last comment to that, that I think one needs to look at the structural dose and then the process dose. Part of our work was around um, looking at the structure in place and whether that related at all to the quality of process. And I think the more we can make those comments, those connections, the better. Nancy Linton, I'm from Amher University of Texas Medical Center, National Lady of Sickness and Quality Indicators. And I, I think this has been a fascinating panel and there's so much to discuss and I applaud you all on your studies. Um, it seems to me that we need to ask the what for question uh, right now uh, as we're on the brink of a new modality of measurement basically and distinguish between measures for quality improvement and measures for some research that shows that hitting people with you know 600 measures of what this hospital did is uh, not useful, but a composite measure of, of the quality of nursing might be. Uh, the, the National Quality Forum has for years focused on uh, trying to urge people to measure outcomes, patient outcomes, not process indicators. And uh, the nursing measures that have been endorsed by, by NQF tend to be outcomes and not process measures. So yeah. while mm -hmm. most of the medical measures are process, not outcome measures. So I think the, I think my urging for nursing would be actually in the development of process measures that you could use for quality improvement purposes on the performance of evidence-based practices or to, to do research on what practices would be effective and then turn those into measures. And those things in their greater detail would be uh, the, of the most use for internal uh, quality purposes. Thank you. I could add the good news that the, that the common formats actually do have process measures yeah. in them. So, and that's because they're intended for use by patient safety organizations for both public reporting, but also performance improvement. So um, those data are there and then they can be used as needed. So that's the good news. Okay, we had a question in the back. Um, I had a qu it's Barbara Resnick. I had a question I can't see, so I'm not sure which person <laughs> did the presentation around patient satisfaction. And if, and this may be more, and I don't study this, so it's total ignorance here. And it may be more in your interpretation of findings, but one of the things that's always frustrating in geriatrics, sometimes what patients want is not what they need. Sometimes what Americans want is not what they need. Maybe they're the same thing. And so I sort of, I, and I know patient satisfaction is really important to hospitals and nursing homes, but I, I really think when we reflect back on the last presentation we just heard and where we need to go with healthcare, there's a real discrepancy here. So how do you address that? That's a very good question. Um, our our uh, goal is, and we don't even call it patient satisfaction, but everybody uses that term, it's the patient experience. And in fact, the there are, we called it down to 10, 10 things that children find important to them. And all of them are basic nursing care. So we're not 
we're not asking, they're not asking for something that they shouldn't get. Um, they're not asking for, um, well, some of them want, you know, more video equipment or something, but um, for the most part, they, they are things that nurses <coughs> probably know are important to children, but they don't ask. They don't, they kind of, they go into the room because they have to check on them every hour at <coughs> least, and they say the same thing. How are you doing? Do you need anything? And they don't ask them, how, how are you feeling? Um, you know, what would make this day better for you? So what we're proposing is that um, we're doing a randomized clinical trial right now, and, and that we don't care so much <laughs> about the post-discharge satisfaction. We care about the experience they're having at the, that time and what can be done to improve their experience. So in our trial, we're, we're administering this 10-item uh, questionnaire, which just is 10 items, and then uh, three options for response. You know, how often does your nurse talk and listen to you, you know, hardly ever, sometimes all the time. And then we ask them, so how does that make you feel? And if they say, makes me feel good, that's great for them, that's, that's enough. Or it doesn't matter, or it says it makes me feel bad or sad. That's the cue to action for nurses to follow up with some questions. So. You know, tell me a little more about this. What what can I do differently? And and they're all they're not usually difficult things to do, but we're hoping that when nurses get this feedback, that they will um, alter the care plan in whatever way needs to be done. I mean, sometimes it's simply the little boy doesn't like to be called sweetie. You know, so you know, why not? communicate this information to the rest of the team so that, uh, you know, another thing we, we would like to do but haven't is um, maybe have a little whiteboard for the kids to say the three most important things for me, for you to know about me, you know, and it could be don't call me sweetie or, um, <laughs> you know, don't wake me up, <laughs> which is um, sometimes one of their primary complaints. So. It's, a pro it's the process of care that's important to the outcome, which we, you know, nurses care for these patients 24 hours a day, and they are the leader of the team that, you know, impacts the children. And so we think that the processes are as important as the outcome. And we also think that if the children feel like they're, they matter, and their opinions are being addressed, that we think the parents would be happier too, and maybe their patient satisfaction, <laughs> quote, patient satisfaction would go up. Yes? So well, patient satisfaction, especially in pediatrics, might really, if they feel important, they feel they're listened to, they may have more yeah. self-care agency. Well, and we don't know that yet, maybe, but we're, 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 maybe that's where our next prime focus would be too. Right, one well, of I, the items is privacy and respect. Yep, but those are all important. Yeah. My other thought is though to support what um, <coughs> Dr. Resnick said is that we work at, I work in a, um, an inner city hospital the chances of us ever getting age caps where our patients who are multiple drug dependent patients ever being satisfied with their pain control is never gonna happen to us. And we're gonna get dinged consistently sure. financially for it. So we really need some ways to measure patient satisfaction, not us being the patriarchal people that are the all knowing that we know what's best in our patients still, but taking both into account, increasing their self-care agency and measuring what physically and safety they need. Yes. It's not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. I have a question on the left. Thank you. Um, 
You know, I'm struggling with an issue here around patient satisfaction and what you uh, presented related to these children's perceptions of what good care is. And the fact that someone would call a child sweetie rather than by their name is, in, in my view, in direct conflict with this notion of patient-centered. And I think what you're focusing on here is this concept that we have as one of the golden standards of quality care, patient-centeredness. And focusing on satisfaction and patient-centeredness together, and then the conversation about uh, sometimes what they want is not what we think they need, puts some multiple factors into conflict with each other because maybe what they want despite our best beliefs about what they should have is what we have to respect if we believe in patient-centeredness. Um, look at what goes on in the VA with their medical home model. Their medical home model is patient-aligned care teams. They don't talk about medical homes or healthcare homes. They talk about patient-aligned care teams and have a philosophy that you provide the patient with all the information they need, and then you respect their choice. So I have, I wondered if you have any comments around this issue of patient-centeredness and this conflict between what we think is good for them versus what they tell us they need and where the choice process occurs. Yes, well I think for adults that that's a different question than for the children who are hospitalized in that um, the third most common thing that they liked about their nursing care was that the nurse gave them medication. And they know that in the process of medications, there are pokes and prods and you know, um, IVs and all kinds of invasive measures involved in the medications. But when they explained those statements, it was all around the nurse's approach. And one of them said that she always puts my medicine in, in a chocolate pudding, I think, because she knows that I, I like it that way. And, you know, how hard is that? That's, that's not hard. Um, and so what we're trying to get at is, is patient-centered for sure. And uh, the things that they're asking for are not impossible whereas adults might have different perspectives. I don't know, but I'm going to have to think about that some more. Thank you. Can I add to that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you make a really good point, and it sort of gets at that whole missing piece in the middle, which is what the patient really does, and I think related to that is what is their decision or preference, and then how do they actually act on the information that we provide, which we may or may not be providing. So. So I, I just feel from a measure perspective, we're really, that's a big gap. So if, if we were gonna write the state of the science looking forward, to me, that's an important hole that we need to figure out how to address, especially if we're gonna move to a patient-centric model. We have a question to, uh, in the front. Hi, Kathy Rule from A1. For the two of you working on staffing, I'm wondering if you looked at specifically missed care. There, in the literature, there is work on that. And I know that looking at what the patient got, one would think that that would include the missed care. But I just wondered if you had that way of approaching it specifically. Uh, we didn't. I, I think the whole idea of missed care is just a really interesting one. We, uh, our measure was a multi-item instrument. Uh, measuring quality, so we didn't measure missed care from that perspective. The however to that is we did look at the relationship between perceived quality and future outcomes. One can make some leap that, you know, when poor quality exists, poor, outcome, poor outcomes then exist, and where is the gap? Um, is it in that act action that leads to perception of quality? But we certainly didn't measure it from, uh, directly. Oh yeah, it, that's a whole study, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> beyond the scope of this work, thank you. Um, but I will tell you that, um, not discussed in this paper, because this paper we were asked to really talk about new measures that were developed. Um, 
and our medication administration accuracy measure was developed in a prior piece of work and therefore I didn't discuss it. But we've done work where we look at structure of care, process six safe practices associated with medication administration, and then outcome. And one of the outcomes is missed dose. And so we do, we will be reporting some data on that in a separate manuscript. But um, definitely we see absolutely clearly, um, because there, it's been said that the five rights were really not evidence-based. You've, you've heard that, right? Well, there are actually six rights, and we have the evidence. And we can show which rights, which of those six safe practices link to which uh, medication accuracy outcome errors. So that's coming. Thank you. It's interesting. Additional questions? Yes. But is, wouldn't that be an interesting question for Patricia Benner too? Because again, we're defining. We got. We were working around that because at UCSF, Dr. Benner's office, when I first came there, was just doors down from me, and I knew better than to think about care just as a numerical equation, you know. But so uh, the acquisition of expertise, you know, embodied knowledge we really think experience may be where that is, you know, and that's why we thought it was so important to try to understand how that plays out. And so I take your question like, how many hours does it take to develop clinical expertise of which the certification exam may measure it, but wouldn't that be interesting, you know, to understand? And if we could see care change in the presence or absence of expertise, See, that's where we were going. So and in public health, they used to say either a degree, uh, bachelor's or bachelor's degree, or five years of practice. So that would tend to go along with, and, and I can imagine. But that wasn't evidence-based. Well. <laughs> Except maybe you're thinking that right. based on their hiring and their performance, they decided there was an evidence there. Yeah, I, yeah. Again, you know, deep. Yeah. This is so deep. It's a question in the middle. Hi, I'm Donna Nath from the University of Florida. Um, it's very interesting, this whole structure process outcomes, because that's, as a health services researcher, a nurse, health services researcher, you know, I'm using that framework quite a bit. And I think that when Dr. Resnick brought, brought up the point about, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your name, but it, it brought something to mind to me. How are we gonna measure isn't our measurement of outcomes going to change when we have patient-centered care delivery and processes? Because right now, as a patriarch, um, we're as patriarchal medical system right now. We're telling the patients, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, because we want hemoglobin A1C below seven. Right. Okay. And I've worked with a lot of women who are have diabetes, type two diabetes, even obesity and um, cardiovascular disease. So I'm telling them you've got to lose weight, you've got to change your diet, you've got to take your pills, you've got to monitor your blood glucose. And the patient is saying to me, I can't change my diet, I can't afford the food. Um, you know, all those things that the patient is telling me, but I'm telling them this. <coughs> so my expectations for an outcome then, aren't they going to need to change when we have this patient-centered care? So what are we going to be measuring then? Anybody have any? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Uh, a 
Let's around. go with the expert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we're going to be me measuring um, self-management yeah. and uh, uh, progress towards goals mm -hmm. and looking at how um, that uh, achieves better outcomes than related to those increases in sodium and increase and, and other measures. And I think also that relationship between provider and patient is key mm -hmm. because if it's about that trust and the patient, you know, you become one with that person, I think you can encourage them. The to therapeutic relationship. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Which nurses have. Well, the one thing that I was going to ask a question about um, for the panel is, are we, I'm sorry. Hold on, let's get the mic, because so, mm -hmm. we're recording this, so. Okay. Um, Thanks. I wanted to ask a question about um, care planning, and we hear so much about care planning in the outpatient world and the LCACOs and all of the other um, initiatives, medical homes, etc. cetera. Um, and I see nursing as having the ability to take a very leading role in the care planning process, but the concept of what is a care plan is very different on the outpatient side than what is being developed currently um, in some of these I think it's yeah. a good question. Maybe someone in the audience has more expertise than we do in that particular area. I guess I'd like to build on your comment and yours just prior to your uh, thoughtful question. And that gives also us time to process that question a little bit more because it's deep. And that is, we talked about the therapeutic relationship, but probably well over a decade ago, um, I, I was doing a, a literature review on adherence for the case management association. And um, one of the things I, I left that review with in my mind that I haven't seen refuted yet is that patient progress toward goal to the extent that it requires collaboration and adherence to the plan of care, which is why you cued me to that could actually be predicted if you ask the patient. So this is what's recommended. What about this feels right to you? What about this do you see as problematic? And that if you ask the patient, they would tell you. They would say, this is going to be a problem. The food's expensive, um, whatever. Um, and that at that point, you had the opportunity then to modify the plan, to bring in additional resources to help with the plan. And I've, I've had two case examples in the last two months where s someone with a life-threatening illness was given a prescription and went to the pharmacy and they said, you're not, you're not insured, I can give you this many pills, which was short of the dose recommended. And so the patient had, you know, shorted himself, went back to the doctor, and, and she said, now, you're not doing as well as I expected. Are you taking, he said, no, they only gave me this many. And so the doctor had to hammer. Another case, uh, post-CBA seizure disorder, patient was given, um, was, was prescribed brand name Tegretol, was only able to find generic Tegretol, and yet all advice had been, do not switch your Tegretol. And this was because of an insurance drug store phenomenon. The patient had to have the smarts to A, uh, push this issue, go back to another drug store that had brand name Tegretol, pay cash, and then deal with it. They might have not even taken the Tegretol or done a switch. So there's all these phenomena that are occurring even outside the scope of our awareness. But at the least we can do with our patients um, is to review the plan of care with them and, and line by line to work with them in a realistic appraisal as to the fit between this and their readiness, their willingness, their resources, their, their perception of barriers. And when I think of all the times when people go home, we say, okay, here's your follow-up. Now I want you to read this. Last time, my husband, after community-acquired pneumonia, went home. And he'd been really sick. They brought in the discharge paper and the discharge plan of care. And they said, uh, 
Now, I'm, I'll be back in about five minutes. You read that. If you have any questions, you let me know. And then she came back. She said, any questions? Good. Sign here. And that was discharge teaching. Mm -hmm. And how many times is that standard of care? So I have to add just a little bit about <laughs> I just have to add a, a comment to that about the discharge teaching piece because I think it gets to a point that we've been finding in our research, both the inquiry research and others, th that relates to, you know, in some ways to the plan of care. We have in discharge teaching all this, for the most part in acute care, defined content that we cover on the piece of paper that gets mm -hmm. signed off. Um, and we, when we measure quality of discharge teaching, what we find every time we do it is that it's not the amount of content mm -hmm. um, that we tell patients, but it's how we do it. It's how nurses deliver the care, how they pay attention to patients' concerns, how they're sensitive to their needs, their cultural needs, how they build confidence in doing what patients need to do, connecting sort of to the self-management um, idea that you were talking about. And so I think often we measure these processes as what the nurse tells um, or does rather than how the nurse does it with an individual patient. And I think that's a, a, a challenge in terms of uh, measurement for the future as well. Can I add one thing, Shelley? Um, so I had a chance to think about your question and actually I think no, there's some lessons um, that we maybe could take from research in tailored interventions. Because mm -hmm. in a way, what you're saying is we're tailoring because we're establishing a goal for the patient and giving them then, helping them to maybe have a plan of action and then evaluating that. And in some of our work, we did um, some tailored interventions with men with prostate cancer. And then on a, we almost had to, our evaluation plan had to sort of take it up a notch. So the questions were global. Did you know what your goal was? Did you do anything about it? Was it useful? So you could sort of keep your measures at that level, even though the goal might change. Um, so I, th I think that might be a, a way to begin to think about how to turn that area around care planning into measure quality measurement. We bought some time for really good yeah. thought. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to take the last 10 minutes uh, for summary comments from my panel. Well, I think on behalf of the panel, I would like to thank you all for your questions. And I think we've uh, enriched uh, the dialogue around where we are with quality measurement and where we need to go. And hopefully some of that will spill into lunch. <laughs> Um, and some of the opportunities to uh, see posters, et cetera. So just in terms of cl closing points, as we look at um, our, our research and how it's contributed to addressing these gaps related to measuring the quality, a uh, nurse's contribution to quality of care, um, I think inquiry really supported very rigorous and foundational research. And I think all of us feel like the work that we did related to measurement was really foundational to uh, where we have gone and where we hope to go in terms of advancing the science. Um, but the progress seems too slow um, in this dynamic healthcare delivery environment because um, we've sort of, you know, we're taking the very slow, laborious <laughs> way to get there. So I think we have to somehow figure out models that will allow us to uh, advance the science more rapidly. Um, and I think part of that is figuring out models where this is built into healthcare systems. And um, one of the things that has started to uh, be discussed and actually now developed by some organizations are what are called the rapid learning healthcare system of the future. Um, and to me, that's if we, if we could keep that vision, it might give us some direction. And you know, those are systems in which I think. What's important to quality is built into our day-to-day -day, uh, delivery and then documentation electronically so that we can get real-time data when we have a quality problem and do something about it, not look at a report a month later and try to help the next batch of patients, but what about this person who's afraid because um, nobody checked on them enough? You know, so I, I feel like it, you know, that's where we really, really need to get, get to go. And, um, that, I think that vision can drive us to think in some new ways about how do we become part of some of these initiatives to develop these uh, rapid learning systems. So I'd like to thank you all for attending.